Hey, it's Chris here. In this video, I want to talk about the unaccountable religious entrepreneurs who are leading the evangelical Christian movement in the United States in the direction that we're taking. They are the dominant force. Entrepreneurial uh, Christian leadership is the force leading evangelical Christianity today. It's not a theology-driven uh, movement anymore. It's not a biblical-driven movement anymore. It is a market-driven movement as I see it. And I want to just put that forth here in this video because I'm beginning to realize more and more as I reflect on it that Donald Trump and the MAGA movement is a symptom like pain with cancer. And the reality is when you want to get rid of pain associated with cancer, you treat the cancer, you get rid of the pain. And right now, the, the cancerous disease uh, that exists in the evangelical Christian movement is something that needs to be diagnosed, identified, and, and treated. And, and I think a lot of uh, people have written these books. I've, I've read a number of books of really good diagnostics and, and uh, under trying to understand what's going on uh, within the evangelical Christian movement. The thing is, is most of those books are written for people like me or other academics where uh, maybe a thousand to maybe 3,000, if it's a great selling book, will buy and read the book. And if it's selling three to 5,000 copies, uh, then it becomes a book that uh, all the uh, leaders in, in the market will say, well, this is a, a influential topic. But the the, the reality is that many people who would be watching this video who are evangelical Christians, who are Christians in churches throughout the United States, they don't spend, and, and you probably identify, you don't spend your time reading a lot of these books. And so therefore, when things are happening all around you and you start to feel unsettled, uh, uh, spiritually and religiously, and, and many people are leaving evangelical churches now uh, because they sense that there's something wrong. They don't really know what it is, but they feel like there are things happening that just aren't right. So many Christians are leaving churches right now. Uh, many other Christians are staying because they're just used to staying, and that's and, and they're not leaving their faith, but they recognize that something just isn't right, that there's a malaise, that, that, that things aren't just the way they, they should be. And because of that, uh, there is an unsettled subtleness uh, to that. Uh, and so I wanna talk about that and more address on the popular level to, to talk, not, not to talk to other pastors so much, or talk to academics and all that. I'm, I'm a country preacher, my heart is for people, and I'd rather just talk to people that are in the pew straight up and be honest about what's happening. In these series of videos, what I'm hoping that I can prove is the hypothesis that the evangelical Christian uh, alignment with the MAGA movement is more cultural and political than it is biblical in nature. And I've written more extensive notes, so you probably see me glancing down more because I just don't want to miss the flow as I have thought through this. I've just realized that there's too much for me just to uh, uh, wing it, so to speak, and just share my heart. So I wrote my heart down so I can share my heart with you uh, in, in a more accurate, uh, a complete way. But the first thing before we can jump into uh, religious uh, entrepreneurs that are totally unaccountable, before we can talk about that kind of leadership within the evangelical Christian movement, the first thing we've got to do is jump into the backstory a little bit, and we'll be doing backstory in several of these videos that I, that I have mapped out to do, because evangelical Christianity is a movement within Protestantism. So we've got to jump back in time, and we've got to kind of look at some things and how things developed, and how in the United States, uh, evangelical Christianity took a sharply different turn than uh, some other places in the world and, and recognize uh, what those things are and just deal honestly with them. Uh, my goal is not to uh, promote evangelical Christianity or just to put it down, but to rather just have an honest assessment of its strengths and weaknesses from somebody who by 
even though I don't like being called part of evangelical Christianity, anybody that looks at my beliefs would say, yeah, he's in the evangelical Christian tradition. And, and that is an accurate statement. The, the problem is for me and for many like me, uh, the tradition is rapidly leaving me because these uh, unaccountable religious entrepreneurs are leading evangelicalism in a radical different direction than it has been historically. So in, in a sense, uh, people like me are feeling abandoned and maybe you're feeling abandoned as well. So we wanna jump into the backstory. You know, um, first, I just even jump back all the way to the creation of the, the Bible and the scriptures and reading what we call the Old Testament and the apostolic witness that we call the New Testament the writers back then gave warning to those who have placed their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Lord Jesus Christ as the, the only begotten Son of God, who was crucified, died, buried, and raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven. The writers of those who embraced this faith, this Old and New Testament Christian faith, warned that there would be false teachers and false prophets who would lead faithful astray if they could. And from the beginning, Israel worked through, uh, had to sort through writings to determine which ones were true and came from God and which ones were false in the product of human imagination. And what was uh, the true teaching and what was false teaching. And after the apostles uh, uh, died, and left writings, uh, the church had to sort the, the, out through those things, which really came from the apostles and, and their community and which are false and fake and were created uh, to pretend to be part of the apostles' teaching, but really weren't. They had to work through what was false and what was true, what was genuine and what was fake. And just like in the days of Israel, in the days of the church, there are going to be false prophets and false teachers who would lead people astray. And beyond that, the church had to wrestle with reading the Bible in harmony. They wanted to reconcile how each part shed light on God's truth and how each part shed light on the other parts of scripture. They believed that the scripture was telling one unified whole story and that it was accurate and true and reliable and where there was struggle in understanding how the parts fit together wasn't a problem with the scripture being inaccurate but more of an inaccurate understanding or somehow we've lost some things and so there was this desire to reconcile this vast body of teaching into a united whole of the apostolic the Christian faith that came from the apostles. And the greatest challenge the early church faced uh, were things about the very nature of God. The scriptures pointed to one God who is trying in nature, and that gave birth to the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, they wrestled with truth and error regarding the nature of God and what the Trinity meant and didn't mean. There was a lot of discussion for centuries and, and many brilliant minds working on this to say what's true teaching and what's false teaching. Another challenge was the very nature of Jesus Christ himself. The Bible presented him as having both a human nature and a divine nature, yet being one person. So how do you do that? Again, the early church had to wrestle with the nature of Jesus Christ. And with great effort, they wrestled with many false teachings concerning the nature of God and who Jesus was. And there came a con consensus that was reflected or handed down to us to future generations in the early creeds, such as the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Apostles' Creed, were all trying to capture the biblical Christian faith, to summarize what the Bible taught about God and about Jesus Christ, about salvation, about the Holy Spirit. And, and the idea was, is we've got to put these biblical statements of faith together, reflecting the teaching of scripture so that we can help Christians, all Christians in all ages and all places in the world, uh, 
begin to distinguish between what true Christianity is and what a counterfeit is. And the best way to do that is to help people understand these summaries of what the Bible taught. And over the, the centuries, the church continued to struggle with truth and error in areas of Bible teaching. Uh, when uh, Christianity had the status of being the official religion in many different nations and city states, the church, Christianity, became corrupt and it became a conduit of earthly power and wealth. So by the 16th century, uh, the church had been thoroughly corrupted by its status of having the force of government behind it. Church and state were mixed together so that the two were virtually indistinguishable. And the result was co corruption, compromise, idolatry, wickedness, and all in the name of Jesus Christ. But there were always true believers who belonged to Jesus in every generation. And despite all the corruption, we can see Jesus protecting and preserving a remnant, uh, often obscure and, and small, but present. But finally, at the dawn of the Reformation, there became a huge momentum uh, led by men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, and thousands and thousands of other uh, uh, leaders, uh, men and women, who started to say, let's return to biblical Christianity. Christianity, ad fontes, let's go back to the sources. Let's look at what the early church fathers said. Let's learn uh, Hebrew and Greek and read and study the Bible for ourselves. Let us learn the history uh, of, of the nations in the world in the time uh, of Israel and in the time of the church. Let us gather all these information so we can know, so we can go back to biblical Christianity. And, and there was this great cry and this ground swelling and saying, we're tired of the corruption, we're tired of the compromise, and we want to get back to the original biblical Christianity, and we want that to begin shaping the life of uh, the church. And so more and more wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church in the West and bring it back in line to the teaching of the Bible. And they started to protest the compromise and corruption and these reformers became known as Protestants, those who protested. They didn't want to leave the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted to reform it and bring it back in line with ancient Christianity of the apostles. But the compromise and corrupt leaders of Rome resisted reform and cast those out who were protesting the corruption in the church. And across all, all of this, the reformers were united by five uh, our five principles. First, that, that the Bible alone determines the faith and practice of Christianity. That to understand what we are to believe and how we are to live, we have to go back and get better and better and better understanding of Christianity. We need to know the Hebrew. We need to know the Greek, the original languages. Well, we need to know how those languages work and how to interpret them. We need to know the history and culture uh, surrounding Israel and, and uh, around uh, the Greco-Roman world of the first century. We, we need to understand these things so we can be better readers of the Bible and can understand the Bible because scripture alone forms and shapes the church. And because of that, we have to be very, very careful not to just let tradition take over, that every generation has got to reevaluate itself in light of the teaching of the Bible so that tradition doesn't shape the church, but the Bible shapes the tradition. So the tradition that develops and maintains and, and keeps going from generation to generation is, is what the apostles had left us with when they died, the apostolic biblical Christian faith. And that was a great concern of them. They also realized as they were studying the scriptures more closely that salvation is by God's grace alone and cannot be accomplished or earned by good works. And that united all of the reformers. They were also united in this conviction as Jesus is the only one who can save anybody. They were also united in this conviction that faith in Jesus Christ alone is a vehicle by which God grants salvation to human beings. And since salvation is wholly the work of God alone, he alone gets the glory for 
saving human beings instead of praise going to other human beings. The idea of celebrating the majesty and bowing before uh, the leaders uh, of the Roman Catholic Church as some kind of semi-divine, the popes and the, the cardinals, so that they were just human beings and God gets the glory, not the church. So what, the reform, what these reformers recognized uh, was that there was a need for more complete statements of faith. As they began to study the Bible and see what the Bible said as a whole, they said, we need a more complete statement of faith. We need to have a confession that is a full statement of all the Bible teaches so that our people, the people that we're preaching and teaching to, will get these biblical summaries. And, and with these confessions, we're gonna put scripture references so people that are learning and studying the faith can see in the Bible where we get these uh, statements. So they recognize that uh, not just the creedal, the shorter statements about uh, uh, who God is and who Jesus is and, and the work of the Holy Spirit and, and what's happening as redemption is applied in the life of Christians, these shorter statements that were basically designed to be confessed and, and said together in corporate worship services as a way to help Christians, uh, the people in the pew learn the Christian faith, that there needs to be something more. There needs to be a more, a broader, a greater confession that pastors can use to learn the Christian faith and then pass that Christian faith on to others. So as these different uh, traditions are merging out of the Protestant tradition, the overall Protestant tradition, the reformers, they started to make these robust statements of faith called confessions. And over the next hundred years, uh, they were being virtually developed in every different language in every different part of the world. We're developing these confessions out of the Reformation. You know, again, the Reformation is, you know, 99% centered on on Europe, so that's where most of them came, but they're ones in French and Italian and Spanish and German and Dutch and English, uh, all being done and produced by these different traditions coming out of the Protestant Reformation to give a more complete and solid statement of what they believe the Bible taught. So you saw things like the Augsburg Confession in 1530 for the Lutherans, for the uh, Reformed on the continent of Europe, you saw the Belgic, Belgic Confession in 1561, the Anglicans, or in the United States called Episcopalians, the 39 Articles of Religion in 1571, uh, among the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, uh, Independents as they were called, the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1647, and the Baptists, the London Baptist Confession in 1689. These were all extended statements of faith by various Protestant groups clearly stating what they believe the Bible taught. If you read all of them together, as I have done, you will see an amazing unity. There is some departure in secondary matters like the meaning and mode of baptism, the Lord's Supper, church government, how the government is to uh, work in the church, and the relationship, uh, for example, between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, so a lot of these more speculative things, things that have been disputed for centuries in the church, there was there is a little variation in those. But when it comes to the essential Bible teachings, the core teachings of the Christian faith, they are all unanimous. And uh, these groups, uh, oh, and I was going to mention this too, there are some groups that are, are less confessional. Uh, we call them the Radical Ref Reformation. Uh, they were part of... Uh, uh, these the ancestors of those are like the Amish and Mennonites today. Uh, but recently, a lot of Mennonite Amish brethren groups that were part of that radical reformation, uh, the Anabaptist groups, as we call them, uh, they have some of them are making their way into the evangelical church family. Uh, even though they don't have a strong uh, confessional history, there's a very strong cultural history. Uh, that kind of transcends modern culture uh, with many of those groups. But that's a whole nother discussion that uh, probably is worth uh, having at some point, sharing some thoughts. But here's the thing, all these Protestant groups train their pastors 
to know Hebrew and Greek, the language of the Bible, as well as the writings of the early church. They knew the ancient creeds and what false teachings gave rise to them. They embraced one of the major confessions of faith, which was part of the tradition they were ordained to ministry in, that they would know it. And it was a guardrail that helped them stay within, uh, be biblically faithful in their preaching and teaching and help them to spot when they were going astray. And when a pastor stepped out of those guardrails, there were other pastors, other part people in that a tradition that would hold them accountable for where they were going. And if they wouldn't listen to those that were trying to hold them accountable because they were departing from the guardrails and going way off on a tangent with their faith expression, uh, they would have their ordination removed. They would not be recognized as a preacher or teacher in that uh, group anymore because their teaching was departing the true biblical Christian faith and going into the uh, realm of false teaching and, and error. So there was a lot of consensus being kept and maintained out of the Protestant Reformation among the various Protestant groups. But the takeaway is this, creeds and confessions served as the guardrails to the Christian faith to keep pastors and churches from falling away from the true Christian faith. The second thing is pastors were expected to be competent in handling the Bible, to know the history of doctrine developed, uh, how doctrine developed, and to spot false teachings and errors, and, and to know the biblical basics for specific beliefs that they are articulated. Uh, that was just the expectation. And the battle between truth and error has been present since the beginning of time. All through history, the Christian church has had to fight to embrace, or had to fight to embrace truth and re, uh, reject error. Sometimes we've been more successful than others. Other times, uh, con uh, counterfeit Christianity uh, rises up and becomes more dominant than the true biblical Christianity. We even saw that in the history of Israel, where uh, idolatry and apostasy would often rise up and be more dominant than the true uh, biblical religion uh, that Moses gave to them in the, in the history of Israel. But there was always a remnant of faithful believers. But what is, what is uh, different here in the United States and it's been emerging throughout the world uh, in the last couple cent centuries, is that our government decided that the government shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. The church and the state were split apart. The church did not control the state. The state did not control the church. In the past, the church, when it had this symbiotic relationship with the state, the state could always, uh, they could always appeal to the state to suppress what it considers to be error. But there's no such provision here in the United States. And personally, I'm glad of it because if counterfeit Christianity gets in power, it will lead to the persecution of true biblical Christianity. Centuries ago, many Protestants were slaughtered by govern governments controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And as Protestantism grew and gained control of governments themselves, we ended up with decades of war between governments controlled by, by Catholics against governments controlled by Protestants. Even today, many non-Christians point out these so-called wars of Reformation as evidence that Christianity is a bad thing. The problem isn't that Christianity is a bad thing, it's Christianity and control of a government that's a bad thing because many corrupt, false teaching, non-believing leaders rise to power and pursue power in the name of Jesus when earthly power and authority is the prize. But here in the United States so far, we have not granted religious leaders the power and the authority of being in control of the government. As long as we are a democratic republic that does not establish any official religion, we won't uh, have to worry about that. But if we do slip into totalitarianism and authoritarianism, then government leaders can favor one religion over another as a way to gain and keep power. And that is gonna be a danger, especially if it's Christians 
that are the recipients of that favor because then there will be a rapid rise in corruption, even more so within the church. But there is a cost to the separation of church from the state. The cost that freedom of religion uh, of means is that uh, w what the cost is and what it means is that anyone can create a church and call it what they want. Even false teachers can create a religious group and call it Christians. In the uh, 19th century, Joseph Smith used the freedom of religion to establish Mormonism. Charles Taze Russell used the freedom of religion to establish the Jehovah Witnesses. Mary Baker Eddy used the freedom of religion to establish Christian science. All these are examples of what is clearly not part of the Christian, evangelical Christian movement. And we could add multiple, multiple, multiple movements that make reference to Christianity, but at their core are not Christian in the historic biblical sense at all. They may use the Bible tangentially, but at the core of their message is not biblical Christianity. So any person can use, in the United States, can use entrepreneurial gifts and they can create their own group, religious group, and call it Christian. They can call it a church. And there is no accountability for them even to know the basic core teachings of the Christian faith, to even be competent in handling the Bible, to even have any sense of understanding how Christianity has grown and matured over the centuries. There is no one to check them when they fall into error. They are an autonomous teacher and the only people that would hold them accountable are the sensibilities of the people that are their devoted followers. There is no outside accountability. You know, the modern evangelical Christian movement is less and less influenced by the traditions that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. Even uh, the one biggest case of the ones that were uh, by conviction uh, have the independence and autonomy of the church, the Baptist, uh, due to their that belief, virtually have no control over the, the preaching and teaching of those churches uh, within that would call themselves Baptist. And virtually all of those churches have little understanding. They don't know about the London Baptist Confession. They don't know about the Philadelphia Confession or the New Hampshire Confession or any other historic Baptist Confession. Every, every church just does what is right in their own eyes. And that Baptistic tradition with its independence and autonomy really resonated in the United States that were trying to break the chains from, from Europe. So the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the, the Presbyterians, the, the reform groups, all of them uh, represented a connection to the old world and the new world really liked uh, the Baptist movement, and it spread like wildfire in the United States, so much so that Baptist or Baptistic groups that function uh, as Baptists theologically that have the independence and autonomy of the local church at its very core uh, are the dominant uh, belief group in the United States. And that's just, that's just a fact. And there is very little accountability. There is virtually no accountability because uh, a tr an association could, could say, well, we're going to disfellowship you, but the pastor and the church could go on. There's no, uh, there's no check and balance to these entrepreneurial religious uh, leaders. They're just, there's just none of, none of them. And another video, I'm going to discuss theological liberalism and its impact on evangelical Christians and how that shapes how evangelical Christians position themselves politically. But for now, I just want to recognize that as a whole, evangelical Christianity is influenced and led by entrepreneurial Christian uh, leaders who have built large empires of wealth and influence through their ability to build and hold followings. A uh, statistic I saw not too long ago, about 70% of Christians worship in the top 10% largest churches in the United States. Christian media, TV, radio, music, print, internet have become multi, 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 many times multi over billion dollar industry with very high stakes. It is a competitive environment for these entrepreneurial leaders uh, to gain and keep wealth and influence. 
and there is a vested interest, I believe, to align politically uh, with those uh, that would best advance their uh, ability to keep and maintain wealth, power, prestige, and influence. And so those these entrepreneurial religious leaders are going to influence their followers to align politically with those that are going to be in their best interest. It's not the best interest of Christianity or of Jesus Christ or the best interest of even their followers. It's in the best interest of those leaders that their followers support whoever will give them and put them in the best possible position. Basically, just to summarize here, evangelical Christianity is now dominated by pastors who are not accountable to anyone for anything they teach. Evangelical Christianity is now dominated by pastors who have no accountability to uh, outside of the no accountability outside of the groups that they have created to maintain that they have created, and they and, and because of that, uh, all the accountability they have are people with strong personal loyalty to them who have sat through their teaching. So if they have embraced false teaching they're not going to challenge the false teaching of the leader that gave them the false teaching. Uh, evangelical Christianity has become the playground of unaccountable Christian leaders who are driven by entrepreneurial impulses. These are the people leading the evangelical Christian movement in the United States. And these entrepreneurial Christian leaders who often know very little about the historic Christian faith and sound principles of Bible interpretation have decided that MAGA is their best chance of keeping their wealth, influence, prestige, and power. So Donald Trump and MAGA is a symptom of this deeper disease in the Christian church in the United States, uh, particularly evangelical Christianity. And, and so I really have been, as I've been thinking about this, I think that we, uh, especially, people that are not leaders, not known, nobody cares about, nobody thinks about, uh, if, if we're pastoral leaders, that we want to help our churches think about these things and recognize the environment that we're in. And then if you are a, a Christian, you're in the pew, you're part of a Christian community, or you've, you're still a Christian, but you've dropped out of the church because you're so disgusted, I think part of it I'm hoping is that we can form a community to discuss these things and think about how we can have a positive impact and how we can begin to address some of the cancer disease that we're all sensing and seeing and feeling within the evangelical Christian movement. And how can we act as uh, doctors and, and, and healthcare people trying to, to help, uh, help uh, get rid of the cancer and see a greater health. And of course, this is a spiritual endeavor. We do, don't do it without much prayer, without much Bible study, uh, without humbling ourselves before God. But I do think it is time now for Christians to really begin to think about taking action and putting our foot down and saying enough is enough. We, you know, Christianity isn't a product to be marketed to tickle ears and make people feel good and happy and give lots of money to just a few people so they become multimillionaires over and over again as, as Christians. But what we want is we want a true biblical Christian faith that is led by people that are deeply uh, uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and willing to give up everything, sacrifice everything, is not driven by wealth and, and power and prestige. And I, and I do think we need to be talking about these things because uh, things aren't going to change until we begin to talk about this and begin to think about how God might use us to be, be an agent of change to what we see as a real uh, problem. I, and, and maybe I'm the only one out there that does, but I, I just judging from the comments in the community that's kind of uh, forming around this channel, I think there are many of you who think and see and feel the same thing. So let's figure out ways that we can work together for the glory of God. Thanks for watching. God bless.